My name is Yuri Tamanian, and this is my final project for 6963 Digital Forensics. Um, my final pro project is focusing on web browser artifacts. Uh, I was really curious to see what kind of um, data web browser web browsers um, hold, where they hold them, uh, how easy is it to get to it, and could it potentially help in a you know future forensic investigation where there's not that much information to go off of but particular key data points can help establish a timeline and whatnot so let's get started <coughs> browsers you know everyone uses browsers um, Chrome Safari IE Firefox they're all doing uh, things a little bit different but in the end it's really the same thing um, but it boils down to a couple of key questions can I really trust my browser you know um, it usually prompts me for a lot of uh, saved information, you know, autofill data. Am I comfortable giving it that data? And what exactly can they do with that data? You know, uh, does it just stay on my computer? Is it on the servers? Does it get sold somewhere? Um, how is this data being stored? You know, what kind of um, infrastructure and framework are they using uh, to store it locally on my computer? And is this data safe and secure? So what do browsers typically log? You know, we've definitely seen pretty much from everyday use uh, tons of prompts, you know, when you're logging in with username and password, um, when you've just purchased something online, when you've just even filled in a credit card. Um, Google Chrome being uh, your best friend, so to say, uh, will try to give you the added convenience of just saving this stuff. Um, and you know, regular average Joes will think, sure, that's great, I never have to type in uh, my credit card, my password, ever again, but you know, all that information gets stored locally um, as well as uh, on the cloud if you do have cloud sync going. Um, and believe it or not, you know, um, it, it's really easy to capture that information, you know, locally wh or uh, by just remoting into a computer or just, you know, when doing a forensic image, grabbing. A specific user profile and you know, it's a treasure trove of information there um, so a lot of this information you know aside from key data points like your cookies your browser history that's stuff that the browser is going to get regardless because you know by the very nature of browsing um, it's going to collect that but you can also kind of minimize your footprint you can uh, minimize your digital footprint of what gets left behind and what information can actually tie you down to certain events or things by just willingly not giving out the information. Just hit no, you know, for never. Or when it asks to save your password or uh, your credit card, don't do it. Uh, that's, you know, uh, a lot of times even the last four digits of a credit card can be useful or an expiration date uh, for an attacker or someone. Uh, even doing a forensic investigation, you know, getting the expiration date, that's already um, evidence that can help kind of lead someone on the right track. And again, it's always a convenience and a privacy trade-off thing. So <coughs> let's, let's talk about how browsers work with the cloud. Um, actually before, um, at least with Chrome, you know, when Chrome first started, uh, there was no cloud sync and usernames and passwords are kind of just, and Firefox did this too, um, just kind of out in plain open. Um, they weren't even really encrypted, so to say, with your password like they are now. But um, even you know when you're um, syncing all your data to the cloud, and it gives you this nice prompt uh, message saying, "Oh, don't worry, everything's encrypted um, with your password, and it's on the cloud, and no one's going to access that." Well, you know someone doesn't need to go and crack Google server to get your uh, data. They can go locally, they get access to a computer, even if you're Windows password, and they can grab a lot of this information. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing is, um, you know, the browsers log a bunch of data points. That includes your history, you know, where you've been, um, cookies, things like creation dates, set times, use counts. That's, that's actually really useful information to figure out how often you know, a cookie got generated, or what the expiration data of it is, what type of <coughs> uh, autofill data you're putting in, like what search queries you're using, your Omnibox suggestions, you know, a lot of that, even payment information, credit card, a lot of that information is really useful to a forensic investigator. So, you know, 
uh, like I said, for an investigator in the professional field, uh, this is a great repository of information. And sometimes when you're stuck and you kind of don't have any suspects, maybe that's uh, something you can look at to kind of lead you on the right track or help you um, broaden your scope of what to find. And, you know, saying no to the autosave option, just pretty much anyone is never a bad idea if you're really security conscious. So, <clears throat> Google Chrome, you know, that's pretty much the most popular browser right now. 67% uh, of the world uses it, so why not? use Google Chrome as a guinea pig uh, for a little test experiment so that's what I decided to do you know um, IE Firefox Safari like I said before they all kind of offer the same user experience you'll see the same prompts and they'll do the same things um, but they might store things a little differently or you know it's also OS dependent like Safari so I for my general um, focus on this project it was just really to see how easy is it to obtain certain types of data, how hard is it to obtain other types of data, and just the general process of what kind of information gets logged. You know, that was the, the, the broad aspect of my uh, approach. So, Google Chrome, uh, where does it store its data? Actually, it's pretty simple. It keeps it in one, uh, you know, honeycomb <laughs> of information, one hive of information. That's all you have to go to to visit to grab a lot of the data there on a Windows machine. Uh, that's going to be under uh, your user profile, your user folder, uh, app data, and that's going to be a hidden folder. You just have to make it visible. Local, Google, Chrome, user data, and default. That's where the juicy folder is with a bunch of um, information. And believe it or not, these pieces of information are just individual SQLite uh, database files. One file, uh, the files is a database in that database. There's a bunch of you know rows, columns, primary keys that all that stuff gets linked together. Chrome is able to use it, um, and a lot of information is just clear text. Some information there, like passwords, and I'll get into that a little bit later, is um, uh, encrypted. But you know sometimes having a login name or a last four uh, or an expiration date of a credit card or some search queries sometimes that's really all you need. And it's really really trivial just to get that. It's uh, pretty pretty easy. So let's take a look. Um, this is just a sample directory of that default folder. So as you can see, you've got pretty much tons of these SQLite database uh, database files, everything from cookies to uh, uh, tabs, login data, shortcuts, uh, top sites, visited links, web data. I mean, you pretty much can parse all of these. Some are a little harder to get at because um, they actually, <coughs> well, some are pretty much organized really easily. Other tables here are kind of hidden with file signatures and things like that. So, in doing my research, you know, I came across these, and I just really try to focus on what information can be obtained without any, you know, extra effort whatsoever. So that's what I was focusing on. And it's actually surprising you can get a lot from it. Um, so all those files, by the way can be easily viewed with any just SQLite Explorer. Um, like I said, it's just a database, so we can actually pull up a sample here. So, web data, history, login data, top sites, favicons, cookies. I mean, all of this is, you can get a hex view, um, you can get a table view. So all these databases have tables. All of these tables will have data in them. Um, and in those tables, uh, let me pull up a table view. In those tables is where you can get a lot of information. Um, so, and really, it's as simple as just pointing to a file and having it parsed. But you know, no one's really going to do that manually. That's a lot of work. So why not create some kind of tool uh, that'll do it for us? So that's what I was focusing on. Um, Automating the process with Python, forensic tool for browser artifacts. So, you know, Python really uh, has a cool, neat module, SQLite 3. Uh, that library can help essentially connect to the database um, and perform all the operation we need to do. And it's straightforward enough to do. You know, there's not nothing uh, complicated about it. Uh, it's just really um, finding out what key points you need, uh, key 
uh, variables you want to include in your data and you know most most Chrome profiles pretty much on all Windows machines should really be universal it's Google Chrome is not making 50 million versions of the same version number it's, it's just one so the framework the structure is going to be the same so that's uh, my goal was to see um, how many top um, you know databases I can kind of hit uh, what information could I extract that might be useful and how best to report it and I found out just reporting it and essentially a spreadsheet is probably easiest because you can uh, you know kind of set up a nice neat organized format you can uh, search and it's pretty much easier in a text file so let's take a look so before I actually uh, get into that let's just take a look at some some Chrome some Google Chrome uh, information here so um, if we go back to for example uh, login by the way all of these tables and databases that's uh, just uh, pretty much a dummy Google Chrome installation with dummy text I actually use some extensions to pre-populate some uh, data and like auto fields and autocomplete profiles um, and also I did some manual entries um, but if you take a look, for example, login data, um, you can see what kind of uh, information is getting logged, right? So we have the URL, uh, the original redire uh, URL, redirect URL, um, and the username. So that's actually useful. You know, sometimes uh, a password is only one step of the problem. Getting a username is also kind of hard because you, know, you could brute force a password, but do you know who you're brute forcing it for? So here's a username, um, and here's the interesting part: value, password value, blob da uh, data. So this is actually encrypted, and that's great. Um, Google Chrome uh, doesn't actually do the encrypting; it you leverages Windows and its API to go and encrypt uh, that password field with the user's password and you know that goes through some algorithm and all that um, so Google Chrome doesn't actually do any of the encrypting decrypting it's Windows that does it so you won't be able to easily grab this um, and I really my focus wasn't on trying to break all the encrypted fields it was just trying to see um, what's encrypted what's not you know and just see how they kind of organize their data and you know you'll encounter other um, tables with other values that are encrypted, like cookie values might be encrypted, things like that. Um, so a lot of times where you see blob data, that's usually um, kind of just an encrypted cipher text of the password. So if we go to Chrome and take a look at um, some saved passwords, uh, let's see. So manage passwords. So here is, and this is a dummy account, by the way. Um, here's a password, right? Um, this is technically encrypted with uh, my account password. If I hit show, it'll show me the password. Um, the reason why it shows me the password now without actually prompting me for my Windows password is because I don't have a Windows password. <laughs> Uh, but it'll, it'll still essentially encrypt it on the SQLite table because um, Windows will still be able to put it, push that out as blob data. Um, so technically, you don't, you know, if you ever actually needed to access someone's password, it's as simple as that. That I mean, granted, you have local access to the computer and you're sitting right in front of it. Um, and also, the other really uh, neat trick is since Google doesn't actually do the decrypt thing I mean it, it uses Windows to do it but you can just kinda trick it you know all the stuff is saved um, it's in the database and it's it's querying the database to get it um, you could also trick it uh, through HTML and it's as simple as just changing it from the field types um, so right now if we have uh, Second, type. Type. Here we go. Sorry. Um, nope. 
So, you know, kind of just another really uh, neat hack for uh, looking at that saved data. So, you know, this is just to show you that all this information that gets logged, it's really simple to kind of grab again. And just because it's synced on an encrypted server somewhere doesn't really mean anything. All right, well, let's, let's go and focus on... Um, some Python stuff. So, um, I uh, went ahead and you know wanted to write a Python tool, a Python script that would just go and grab all of the. Essentially, would go and parse all of the SQLite database files and grab whatever it can and report it. Um, so, uh, I originally thought you know maybe somehow integrating it in the autopsy and all that stuff, but I really just wanted a standalone tool that someone could even run on their own profile without having to load a, a huge image in there and things like that. So, you know, if you did want to kind of work with an image for a forensic investigation, then really, you know, process it through autopsy first, find whatever uh, directory you need, uh, you know, that default directory, and just extract the files, stick it somewhere locally, and then just, there you go, you get a local copy there. Um, you know, but really this this is meant to just run mm, locally. So the first thing we need to do is um, SQLite. Uh, actually, so I was coding this in Python two, um, and the latest version of Python two point seven, really point six or something like that, um, it does not have the latest version of SQLite. So one or two of the databases uh, actually were problematic in the sense that they organized some data a different way and the older included version of SQLite was not able to uh, interact with that data. It was just pretty much thrown error. So the first thing you want to do is uh, you know go to the SQLite page, uh, downloads, and go ahead. This is, by the way, this is all tested on Windows 7, 64-bit. Uh, um, Assuming should work fine with Windows 8. Uh, pretty much any Chrome um, directory for originating from Windows. I have not tried this on Mac. Uh, probably it's not going to work because maybe Mac is uh, doing some stuff differently there. Um, but you want to go ahead and grab a uh, 32 bit uh, Windows DLL. Once you get that, you'll get uh, you know an archive and you'll get the latest version of SQLite 3. So really you just have to copy this, go to your um, Python directory, right? Uh, 2.7, 2.7. Go to DLLs and go ahead and just swap out the old DLL with the new one. Um, in fact, you, can, you don't even have to replace it. You can just go and uh, you can just go rename the old one so that you have something to go back to, just in case you know you you actually need that one. Um, you put in the new one. The oldest one was 3.6.21. I think the newest one is uh, 3.9 or something like that. You can query; it's pretty simple. Just SQLite underscore version. Um, so that's that. Once you have that in there, you should be able to actually execute all the stuff. So let's take a look. Uh, we have um we have the python tool right here so all you need to do is really drop this uh in any directory that you want to go and just crawl through and um grab stuff from and you can technically open this up and you know um a python development app run it from there uh, or just run it straight from the command line you can do that too. Um, oh, real big. Okay, so Python Okay, and then SQLite.py and that's pretty much it. You run it, you get a silent essentially execution. You know, I just try to make this as lightweight as possible. Um, 
no crazy switches or options, things of that nature. You know, maybe someone if they want to, when they plan on expanding, uh, when they plan on maybe doing something like this, but incorporating other browsers or adding more functionality, you know, that's great. But for my all intents and purposes, for me, I just kind of wanted to uh, keep it simple, stupid. Um, so let's take a look at what we got. So uh, we were targeting several really, you know, juicy databases, so to say. Uh, cookies, we got an output there. Credit cards, which is part of the auto profile table, we got an output for that. Favicons, history, login data, report, um, web data, more web data, and at finally a report of the execution. So let's actually go back to the tables and take a look again. So, you know, for um, things like Favicons, uh, grabbing essentially the icons, the icon URLs uh, of, of a user visiting a website and uh, favicon URL will be reported so we grab that. Um, maybe not the most useful information but hey you know sometimes some stuff might come up uh, that can also kind of tie you to a specific um, URL visit you know things of that nature. Then you have uh, login data it's a really big one so here we're going through all the stuff trying to collect you know where the ori origination URL came from um, the login data the usernames we want to get all the usernames uh, dates like when it was created when it was used sync dates things of that nature um, we can get history because you know autopsy can actually get some of the stuff like bookmarks and history and um, but this is also giving you just pretty much raw data. You're getting everything. So if you want to see how many times, like what times it was visited, what time was like a certain entry created, you can get that here. Um, so uh, let's see web data as well. You can take a look at autofill data, and that's really uh, useful stuff. You know you're typing in forms, or you're typing in search queries, um, you're typing in usernames and passwords, maybe that aren't like authentic, it's just going through clear text and and just pretty much addresses. That's how Google Chrome actually knows like, oh, you know, did you mean like John Doe or something? Um, it can actually find, uh, kind of suggest certain profiles to insert into fields and that's how it knows because it's storing all the stuff here. Um, and the one th thing it kind of does is for dates it's not universal it does really weird things with dates sometimes it'll save an epic date from uh, the like amount of seconds from um, 1970 sometimes from 1960 or 1961 so I should actually figure that out and or do some conversion because this isn't really useful you want a date and time which you can actually use so let's actually go ahead then and take a look at uh, what kind of information we got so let's look at the report. This will just open up pretty much in any Excel uh, program. Uh, it's a CSV, or you could open up in you know pretty much anything that opens up comma-separated values. Uh, so this will tell tell me what happened. So pretty much grabbed everything and outputted it in a report because everything was in the directory. If there was something that the tool was supposed to grab and it wasn't in the directory then it'll report that and you know it'll catch exceptions and it won't like kill the program uh, during execution so let's start looking at some of this so cookies uh, so let's actually expand this stuff uh, so it's actually should have been there we go Alright, so let's take a look. So we have essentially for this uh, user, uh, you know, for that dummy test profile that I created, um, this is information we got from the cookies. You know, creation time, when the cookies are created, you can kind of tell maybe when a login time was transmitted specifically versus just, you know, browsing a website. Um, you know, you have cookie names, sites, other raw metadata accompanying it. 
uh, you have expiration time, whether it was through HTTP or something else. Um, you know, last access time, that's also kind of useful. So, you know, things with cookies. Um, you can, we grabbed um, login data, right? So, see, the one thing, um, sorry. The one thing uh, CSEs don't do is formatting of you know bold characters and all that stuff, but uh, this is pretty much much I think in my opinion much more easier to read, human readable than like a text file which is a bunch of garbage, uh, garbled information. So you know this is just one account, but had I had like a hundred, in fact I went and processed my own Chrome browser, which have also synced to the cloud, um, but um, I don't have. Really, the stuff I have on there, it's um, it's not really that important. More like forms and things like that. And don't really use stuff anyway. So if I process that, I get tons of information here. Um, but you know, and actually, after doing all of this, it's actually given me a new kind of insight into all of this and got got me a little bit more security conscious. But you know, we're grabbing the URLs. Uh, the redirects and the usernames, um, domains and the creation dates, and how many times the user actually logged in with those credentials. Um, you know, passwords not here because I actually didn't. That wasn't part of the scope I intended to go for this project, which is the cursing passwords, things like that. But you know, that's I've seen functionality. Some people have said it's actually it is possible to decrypt it. Um, so y you know, it's. Uh, it's another thing that can be added, but username is also useful. You know, you can if I do I'm doing an investigation on someone, username comes up multiple times. They're using the same username. That gives me a little bit of uh, uh, more information to establish a timeline or kind of like create suspects, things of that nature. Um, we have favicons. It's pretty straightforward. Pretty much all the URLs for favicons. Um, go if you want to see for someone to just look up the icon. Um, history output. So we're getting pretty much every single history URL that someone went to. Um, we're getting the website title times visited, sorted by times visited actually uh, from the SQL query the times that um, URL was actually typed out versus you know you clicked on something and you get get there um, and actually and you'll notice maybe there's um, certain characters there one thing I had to deal with was with you know to make this all work uh, kinda had to work with Unicode characters and I'll get to that later but that was kind of a little annoying because you know people use different fonts and languages and stuff like that, and you kind of want this to be universal. But um, uh, the way Python works, it just sometimes doesn't like um, different formats. So um, you know, last visit time, things like that. Uh, so actually, yeah, okay. Um, and then some other stuff, you know, credit cards. Uh, pulled credit cards from the saved uh, databases. Um, well, I, I obviously haven't used these, that's why these are blank. But you know, names of the credit cards, expiration months, expiration years, the amount, the times uh, it was used, and the last use date. Um, you know, sometimes I don't need f full 16 digits. If I could get four, uh, the, rather the expiration date and month, that it can maybe pinpoint me to. Which card was in use, or you know whose whose card it was that, things of that nature, or just you know from an attacker, I can kind of find out. Okay, well, is there anything we could do? Maybe uh, some phishing attempts. Call someone up, tell them, oh, your card's expiring. You know, uh, I gotta email you a new one. I mean, email you a new one, and you know, give us the current number, things of that nature. You'd be surprised how many people fall for that. <laughs> but you know, that's something that's useful as well. Um, we're grabbing also uh, web data that's auto completed web data so that's what we saw in the database before um, 
so pretty much all the fields and this is just it's not gonna be related like these are cookie because I was using a cookie tester this is cookie fields um, so that's why you're seeing cookies here usernames and passwords addresses and I'll actually go and kind of label each value each um, field value to field type so that's the field types the save dates that's after we've converted from those epics the uh, Chrome uh, Unix epics uh, to actual readable dates then the last time inputted um, times it was all auto completed so the amount of time someone's actually entering this stuff if I, if I get a hit saying oh this guy is entering this a hundred times and it's pretty popular maybe you know that's tied to something maybe that's something to look at um, let's take a look at auto profile output so this is a good one too so this is actually <coughs> this one involved a little bit more work because uh, Google Chrome splits up auto field profiles according to four or five like several essentially tables and they're all going off of a GUID which is the foreign key to many of the tables uh, ends up being the primary key to those tables but it's a foreign key to the main table which is the auto field profile so I kinda have to you know similar to like a union join or SQL tables you kinda just go and query all of these according to the GUID which have the same ones and you get all this information so auto field profiles you know that's uh, people love that right um, you don't have to enter your pa your um, mailing address ever again or like your pretty much any type of you know names addresses apartment numbers so all that stuff is getting saved as well in um, auto fill settings so Joe Schmo, Abe Lincoln you know that all that stuff is getting saved that's how uh, and it's populating all these from one database but multiple tables so essentially just it's a matter of fact of going and grabbing all these tables into one query um, but if they have that saved right away I'm getting full names the company where they work you know their addresses cities states uh, you know the date that was added where this actually came from was this like an import from the browser was this Chrome setting manual entry things like of that nature times used like maybe I'm shopping on Amazon a million times a day you know maybe it's registered to reflect that so then you know okay that's actually the user's uh, primary home address probably or maybe that's a work address you know time last used um, uh, well that was never used so that's why it's gonna <laughs> report the original time um, let's see you know uh, email addresses phone numbers and this is just sample that I could have had a million other fields here but just to demo this out that's what we're getting there as well um, you know and the credit cards I already showed so and all this information gets put in a report so that's uh, that's how you know what got processed what not so let's actually take a look at some code um, okay so this is essentially the script um, so let's see what's going on here uh, you know here we have all our import statements we're getting uh, SQLite 3 uh, certain system modules libraries uh, things to process time with for the conversion CSV Python has a built-in CSV writer and we can utilize that um, so here here's the problem I mentioned earlier uh, Unicode right so by default Python and this varies from Python 2 or 3 I don't have much experience with 3 so that's why this is kind of all new to me but uh, and, and 3 you can't even modify I think encodings anymore a default encoding so in 2 Python 2 everything's ASCII by default um, a lot of the tables have Unicode characters like Cyrillic or some type of other um, character maybe German uh, characters Japanese characters they're all going through as Unicode so if you're trying to query Unicode and then you're trying to print that into ASCII it can't do the the encoding so essentially this is a little hack it's um, it can cause problems and it actually did cause a problem for me in terms of print statements it kind of broke my functionality of print statements so I had to um, do a workaround to the workaround and I'll show that later but this will essentially allow me to go and 
um, not get hit with encoding decoding errors every time a SQL table is saying, "Oh, this I can't read this because it either doesn't fit, or this is not ASCII, or you know, God knows what." Um, here's a little function uh, just to report um, if uh, you know if if a data parse was uh, successful or not. Um, and I'll get utilized in all the other functions, and that's just reporting to the one file. It's opening up report CSV and then it's appending it in append mode because we don't want to overwrite the CSV every single time. So, you know, the first thing we have is um, our login data checker. So, just to go through one of these, um, you know, because pretty much all of them are straightforward, similar in structure, so this will give uh, people an idea of how this works. But, um, so the main function we have a uh, file system check so we want to see if login data and all of these are hard coded because you know the files won't be changing um, if you're actually utilizing a intact uh, chrome folder it's going to have login data it's not going to be called zyz unless you go and change it so it's looking for login data um, if it's not in the directory then um, you know, it's going to skip execution, just move on to uh, everything else. Um, uh, one second, battery's low. So, uh, okay. Um, if, and if it did skip it, it'll report it in the report file saying it couldn't find it. And that's usually because, you know, one, file doesn't exist, or two, um, database corruption, or maybe can't even access it, but usually, those things would prevent uh, execution. If it if it is in the directory, then we're, we're going to execute further down. Um, we're going to check. We're essentially going to connect to the SQLite database. Um, then uh, we're going to establish a cursor, uh, a query cursor in the database. We're going to call. We're going to essentially label that. Give it a variable. Um, so we can use that cursor later on in that same database to move around and query stuff. Uh, we're going to open up, create and open up our um, um, output file, CSV output file for uh, read and write binary mode. Um, we're going to also uh, utilize a writer, a CSV writer for that um, output CSV file. And what we do first is we create our column headings. Um, that way you know what each column is. So that, that's the first row that gets added. And then we're going to go and we're going to go and uh, take our cursor, uh, execute um, essentially um, a select statement from the SQL table, right? And that's going to go and grab all the columns that we want, okay? Um, all the columns that we want from a table. So we're getting X amount of columns specified from a specific table. And then it's going to grab essentially the row uh, of data just for those columns. And then it's going to go, uh, and this is an iterative approach. There's other ways of just fetching all the rows or fetch one. But this is an iterative way of moving the cursor around from row to row to row to row uh, from top down. And then we're just going to take row, which is containing a set of data of all that um, information, and just writing it to our output CSV file. So that gets uh, written to every single row. Uh, if that's successful, you know, we have a message, uh, and that's going to go and the message is going to get um, sent over to report. And then we're going to close the connection. And then login data, so the function is going to call itself. That's how we're getting execution going here. Um, so same thing here, uh, and also so what we're doing is you know uh, regular uh, SQL statement is usually select something or all f uh, from a certain table where maybe an, a variable has to match or things of that nature. So that's that's what this is, um, and here's where I had to do some uh, conversion of time. So some um, dates were from the 60s. Uh, unlike the typical Unix, uh, which is from the 70s, uh, so um, you just have to do a little bit more math to get that working. Uh, otherwise, it's going to look all weird. And this is, you know, putting it in local time actually for your computer. 
So if we go to favicon, same thing. Check to see if a file, uh, if the database file exists. If not, uh, report it. Otherwise, continue the execution. Take all the rows, output it. Um, same thing with history. Uh, here we're just you know looking for uh, top hits, so we're ordering by descending. Um, and yeah, so sometimes you got to filter out like garbage data. You'll see some nulls or some like padding, and you kind of want to just take one column uh, where there's actually data and just look for anything that has uh, something that's not null. Uh, for cookies, same thing. You know, check to see if the file is there. If, uh, if not, I report that as an error exception and then process a uh, SQL search query from the database. Um, cookies had a bunch of different timestamps that needed adjusting, so that's what this is. We're taking the creation time dates, um, expiration time dates, we're modifying them because this is um, a different year than the typical Unix epic year. Uh, web data, so this is uh, the biggest one. This is actually multiple kind of uh, mini qu uh, queries inside, but the first thing again, we're checking to see if the database file is there. Um, uh, then we're connected to the web data uh, database. Um, we're uh, going to output all the stuff we want, and what we want is essentially a query result for um, all of this right here. And we're going to output that. Um, that's autofill, autocomplete data. So pretty much anything you type, it gets saved, and you can re uh, have Chrome re-enter it. Auto profile. So this is the biggest one. This is where we have to go. A same database. Uh, but utilize multiple tables. So what we're going to do is we are going to again create a, a column of all of our um, uh, values so we can easily identify them. Then, so I actually um, kind of broke this up to make it easier to s read because otherwise it's just a blob. Um, so select from where. Um, we're selecting pretty much columns um, from multiple tables and this is how you one way of addressing them is just kind of that notation you're selecting columns from a table that's how it knows which one's which otherwise there's sometimes an ambiguity error uh, from four tables um, where the GUID is equal to the GUID of table one so the main table to table two and again the main table is equal to the same GUID as the third table so uh, since that's how since the GUID is a foreign key of the in the SQL database, that's how Chrome knows how to kind of like um, consolidate all the stuff in one. And again, you know, profile date modified use time. That's something that needed to get modified. Um, so, and if there's a, if there's a success, then that's going to get put in the report. Um, so the last thing is just checking for credit cards. Uh, we're going to get credit card names, months, like years, use count, um, use date, pull those columns and uh, their respective row data from the credit cards table, write that to our output report file, um, and then report success, close the connection, function gets called, and that's pretty much the execution for the script. Um, so, you know, in conclusion, uh, what can I say? You know, a lot of data can be grabbed from this. Uh, you know, had I had more time, maybe some more expertise, I'd love to uh, go and take a look at uh, encrypted blob data for passwords. See if you know how easy it is to decrypt it. Is there maybe some hacks that you can use make it easier? Um, because, like I said getting local access is <laughs> 10 times easier than uh, trying to go and crack Google servers for encrypted sync data so that's that um, so thank you for uh, watching the video I hope you enjoyed it uh, take care bye bye